Today is July 12th, 2012. My name is Jonathan Kirsch and I'm with the City of Lakewood KLTV Channel 8 and I'm recording this personal history with Johan Cohn for Lakewood and the Jefferson County Public Library Oral History Project. Thanks for uh, doing this project with us. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start off, what's your, fir what's your full name? My first name is Johan Cohn, okay. as you hear it. And uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Hamburg, Germany on January 15th, 1934. That'd be Nazi Germany. It had been under Nazi administration for about a year at the time I was born. Okay. And uh, what were your parents' names? My uh, father's name was uh, Felix, uh, Felix Kohn. Uh, he was a doctor back then, an MD. And my mother uh, was Her Hertha. Uh, we pronounce it Hertha. Many people pronounce it Hertha. Uh, Kohn, her maiden name was Balzen, okay. and, and she was born in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire. And where was your father born? Uh, he was born in Hamburg also. Okay. He was sort of a local skion at that time. My uh, grandfather had been in the city government. Okay. And um, uh, do you live in Lakewood right now? Yes. Uh-huh. How uh -huh. long have you lived in Lakewood? I, we, I've lived in Lakewood uh, since uh, Carmen and I married in 1969. We both voted in the incorporation uh, election. Great. And um, uh, where was Carmen born? Uh, Carmen was born in McAllen, Texas. In what year? And that would have been in 1937, January 23rd, 1937. And do you I, know can't, I can't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know uh, uh, her parents' names? Uh, yes. Uh, her father's name was Jose Guadalupe Cavazos, and her mother was Vicente Cavazos. And where were they from? Uh, they were both from McAllen originally. I seem to remember that my mother-in-law was uh, from up uh, the river a little bit, from Penditas. Okay. And do you have brothers or sisters? Yes, uh -huh. I have uh, a uh, older sister who lives in Florida, uh, Maria Bechtel, and I have a uh, brother, uh, Carl Crane, who lives in the town where I grew up, Hamilton, Ohio, and then my younger sister is deceased. Okay. Uh, her name was Anna Elizabeth. Okay, and do you have children? Yes, uh -huh. my oldest daughter is uh, Kathy Cohn, uh, who lives in Vail. And my uh, younger daughter is Teresa Wolfenden, and she lives up in Montana in Livingston. Okay. And where did you go to high school? I went to high I grew up in Hamilton, Ohio, after my parents immigrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I was only five years old when my whole family immigrated. And uh, my father got a license to practice medicine again in Ohio, and we settled in Hamilton, a place that needed doctors at that time. And uh, uh, I attended grades, elementary school and high school there. Graduated from Hamilton High School in 1951. And how long was the school year? When you were in those days, it was pretty much a solid nine months. In other words, it started right after Labor Day and it ended about a week after Memorial Day. And that was pretty much a fixed schedule the whole time I went through the school district, school system there. And how about college? Uh, college, I went to nearby Miami University for my undergraduate. I'm obviously overeducated. I have four earned degrees, so, uh, but I went to Miami Univ of Ohio for my undergraduate. I was drafted right after into the U.S. Army right after I graduated. And, uh, well, maybe not right after, a few months. And then uh, later on, I got a master's degree from the University of Chicago in social work, and then I got a law degree here from the University of Denver. and finally a, what is called an educational specialist degree, which is kind of a second master's in education from University of Colorado. Okay, and uh, what, what's your uh, profession? I was a social worker uh, my whole adult life, as a matter of fact. I started out, uh, actually before I went to graduate school, I was uh, worked in mental health for the Cook County Mental Health Clinic for a better part of two years, and then um, after my master's, I came out here, worked in uh, protective services to children, which was under a different law and somewhat differently structured than today. And uh, then I went over to Jefferson County Schools when they started their social work program and stayed with them until I retired in 1997. And uh, 
since you're retired, do you, do you have your own business or are you fully um, retired? You know, I I have a nominal business. In other words, I'm still ha I'm still active as an attorney, but uh, I don't accept many clients and try to stay active and do some things. I substitute taught for many years afterwards. I, after, I was a social worker the whole time, but I always wanted to teach history. So when I retired, I would uh, take history assignments, and I enjoyed doing that a lot. Now I stopped doing that uh, last year. What was the most interesting job you've had? Actually, working for Jeffco Schools was of enduring interest. I don't think I would have stayed if it didn't offer something in the way of interesting. It's sort of like every kid that uh, I had contact with and every adult that came through the door, they were an interesting exercise. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that about the clientele really because I saw them because I wanted to help them in some way. But uh, that piece of it was very interesting to me. And tell me, what were your parents' occupations? Uh, my father was an MD, and my mother was actually a homemaker her whole life, but uh, she wrote a book about her experiences in Germany and the United States, and I believe it, it came out some years ago. I think there's still copies in the local library. Under the, I think she wrote it under her pen name, uh, Hertha Balsen Kohn. What was, the, what was the title? Yeah, she, it's a hyphenated title. I may have it reversed. It might be Cohn Bowles, and I just don't remember it. What was the title of the book? Uh, My German Lessons, 1915-1939. Uh, and uh, you said that, uh, that you served in the military. What branch? I was in the U.S. Army. I was uh, drafted in 1955, did my basic out at Fort Ord. And in a great burst of intelligence, since I spoke German, the uh, uh, U.S. Army sent me to Germany. And uh, I was uh, in armor reconnaissance the whole time. Actually, m the two outfits that I was with put me behind a desk. But uh, I also had to do rotation as a regular MOS, as a scout observer. So I did get a few exciting moments uh, in that capacity. I was in what was known as a border outfit, the 14th Armored Cab which was right next to the East German border of that era. And um, I was actually out there with a steel pot on my head and a weapon and all that. How did, how did the, the war affect your family and community back home? Uh, are you th talking about the second, this was after the Second yeah. World War, but because okay. uh, that would have been in 1941 to uh, 1945, you're thinking of the uh, Second World War. Mm -hmm. It had a profound effect. And in fact, when I think of the growing up years, uh, the war broke out when I was actually in third grade. I, well, we entered the war in third grade. Now, as an immigrant family for us, the war really began with the German invasion of Poland uh, when World War II really began, which was in 39. So Pearl Harbor didn't make that big of an impact other than we were never really encouraged to speak German. But uh, at that point, uh, German went away. I, we just, uh, you know, we, the, Germany was the country we left behind and we were Americans now. And in terms of my community, that was the whole effort of the community. Uh, I learned later, I didn't know it at the time because I was just a, l a young school kid, but there were parts of the uh, Hamilton, Ohio, which was at that time a big industrial town. Well, had a lot of industry. I don't know if it was all that big, but um, I, uh, we were forbidden go to go from to certain areas because we were at that point enemy alien until both my parents became citizens in 1944. Uh, we had to give up cameras and, and uh, any radio that had a shortwave band. I don't believe we had one, but, uh, uh, and that was all given back to us then when my mom became a citizen. My dad became a citizen a few months before she did. And uh, when we became U.S. citizen, all that went away. So needless to say, when, when you were first there, there was, there was a lot of tension in the community? Uh, you know, I, people were kind to us in Hamilton, really. I, uh, I remember I couldn't speak English when I started first grade, and the uh, school district had no kindergarten. And um, I just had to learn it myself. I was the only kid in my class who spoke in that first grade class that spoke a foreign language, and I just picked it up word by word uh, until I spoke it. But then we also spoke English at home. so. 
uh, it seemed to go pretty easy, but I remember how nice people were to us. Might have to do with, with the fact that my dad was a doctor. Now after Pearl Harbor, no, it didn't change, didn't really change much. That uh, I remember that. Now uh, later on in my teenage years, I had a developed kind of a different uh, view of my hometown for other reasons. But in terms of ethnicity, no, things worked out pretty well. Going back to your father real quick, um, he was a doctor. Was he a doctor at a hospital, or did he have his own private practice? He had his own private practice. But in, you know, then, as many places now, although this seems to be changing as I speak, um, he was also on the staff of both hospitals. There were two hospitals uh, in town, Fort Hamilton and Mercy. And he was on the staff of both hospitals. So uh, he had patients in both hospitals from time to time because physicians would follow their patients into hospitals. At least that's how I recall it. Okay. <clears throat> Did any of your other family members serve in the war? In World War II? Uh, no, uh, we were all too young to be really in service during World War uh, II, that is. Um, you mentioned World War I. My dad was in the German Army in World War I. He didn't have much choice either. But um, the World War II um, would have been, we were all too young. However, my brother enlisted in the U.S. Army uh, in, I believe it was either 45 or 46, and he served a tour in Korea when there was an army of occupation there, mm -hmm. uh, not the Korean War, which came later. So he shoehorned in there. And I, I was drafted between the Korean War and the Vietnam episode, and Vietnam era, so I didn't see any, I wasn't in a time of great tension. How did, how did those two wars, the, the Korean War and the Vietnamese conflict, how did that affect your community and family? I think in, in the Korean War, it wasn't quite the same thing. It, 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 people didn't relive, in my view, the tension that they had in World War II. It wasn't as total. In fact, maybe that was one of the maybe not so great things about the Korean War is that there was more of a detachment from what was going on. Notwithstanding, uh, you know, local industry did tool up again. Uh, we lost our mayor, as a matter of fact. I believe the mayor of Hamilton was recalled into the Air Force during the Korean War, mm -hmm. and that made a local political scene shift a bit. Okay. Um, and and the in the Vietnam conflict, did that have uh, any kind of effect on your community? Your well, family? I no longer lived in uh, uh, Hamil in Hamilton then. Um, after my service in the Army, I came back, worked for a while in my hometown. I, in fact, I was a substitute teacher then for a while. Uh, but uh, I'd moved to Chicago, where I felt there was more opportunity at the time, and I wanted the experience of living in a big city. And I must say, I got it up to my chin. I'd <laughs> my Chicago experience uh, made me uh, resolve to get away from the place, as a matter of fact. And I, yeah, well, I lived there for the better part of four years. Uh, two years working and then two years in graduate school. How did seeing a man walk on the moon affect you and your family? Oh, that was a big thing. I, we, of course, I lived out here then. I was married. Uh, we had, uh, didn't have any kids yet. I think we'd been married for about a year. And I remember we didn't have a television at that time, of all things. And, but we were at a neighbor's house and saw, actually saw, the, it was in black and white, uh, the first step on the moon. I, that was a very moving uh, experience. I, uh, in fact, I believe that took place the same summer we were incorporated, if I remember correctly. That was in 1969. Are you, are you a big sports fan? No. no. Never. In fact, it's strange you should mention it. When I was in high school, yeah, I went to all the games. Uh, in fact, I was an announcer for the, that is, on the public address system, not on the broadcast, for the basketball games. And after I left high school, I just never, I thought it was sort of like when I become a man, I put away childish things. I, I, sorry, I have to view it that way, but maybe that's why I never made it in politics. <laughs> What would you say the greatest achievement mankind has experienced during your lifetime? I think the greatest achievements are the eras of peace that we've had. We often overlook them. I, I think of the 1990s when we weren't, you know, after the wall came, Berlin Wall came down and there was no more Cold War. I thought that Clinton era really had a lot of promise in it. And I think some of the things that were achieved, not only in this country, but in Europe, 
And you know, when I went, I've been in Europe a couple times during that era. Well, about three times, as a matter of fact, four times. But um, uh, it's how much has really been achieved that countries that really fought each other and devastated each other now live at peace. And I, you know, I wish we would focus more on that lesson. I, I, it's obvious that you know I'm not a. I, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm a. Uh, I can't give the word momentarily. Just overlooking all these things, uh, because I know the world is in conflict too, and we we can't disengage from that. But we should be focusing on the areas in which we can make, have made, and can make real progress. When, when you were young, after you immigrated from Germany, did your, did your family, uh, were, were you active in community groups and in the churches, organizations? Yeah, we've had that involvement. Uh, are you speaking of me personally your or family? Family. family? Yeah. Uh, uh, from the first, um, you know, we attended a Lutheran church in Germany and we did that in the United States also. And I was, uh, uh, well, I was baptized in Germany before we left, but I was confirmed in uh, the local Lutheran church and uh, stayed active there. My mom was quite active. My dad helped form, I think, a local discussion group. It was called the Acorn Club. He had been in other groups before that. And uh, my mom then got together with the women and they formed what was called the Chestnut Club. And I, I've never figured that one out, you know, acorns from mighty oaks from acorns grow. But uh, my mom, uh, uh, that group is still active. I don't know where the men's group is active, mm. but I believe the women's group is active to this day. My mom died in 2003 at the age of 100 and stayed reasonably active all her life. I think the last de decade of her life, she went into some decline. How did you meet your wife, Carmen? We were both working for uh, Jeffco Schools and a mutual friend, a social worker, said, yeah, you should meet this guy, he'll take you out a few times, so, you know, well, that's how we met. How uh, long did it take before you realized that she was the one? Hmm. I thought about that question because you <laughs> flew it by me. Uh, you know, it's one of those personal things that aren't easy to interpret, but, and thinking about it today wasn't very long, uh, maybe two, three months, something like that. And then we actually married about a year after we met. And what do you remember about your wedding? What's that? What do you remember about your wedding? You know, it was a pleasant affair. Just friends, I, we, we didn't have a huge crowd, didn't want one really, but uh, Carmen comes from a large family and every, a lot of people showed up uh, and a lot of local people who knew, to, knew us showed up too. We were married here at St. Bernadette's uh, and, um, and it was very pleasant. I really liked talking to people and it was pleasant for other reasons too. Do you, do you, does your family get together for a lot of family reunions? My own family does not. Um, as a matter of fact, my extended family is really widely scattered uh, and they don't all live in the United States. I have cousins in Africa that I've never met on both sides of the family as a matter of fact. Uh, back in Germany when you were born, were you born in a hospital or at the house? I was born in a, I guess you would call it the closest thing in the United States would be a lying-in clinic. It was on Havesta uh, in uh, uh, the, har uh, well, I, it's hard to translate it, but the Havesta section of Hamburg. Uh, we lived in what a place called Fulspital, which is still by the airport. There was an airport there then too. Uh, I've been back in fact, I was back recently, so I kind of was recently uh, kind of caught up on that. And do you remember uh, your family's first getting a telephone? Did you have telephones either in Germany or? It's interesting you that you should say that because when we lived in Hamburg in 1939, apart from the fact that we were painfully aware that the Gestapo could be. Uh, you know, apprehending our phone conversations. We had a dial telephone. We, we would dial. Now, when we moved to Hamilton, we didn't have dial telephone. We had to utter the numbers over the phone. And we didn't get dialed phones there until 1946, as a matter of fact, when I was in junior high school. And then we had to use a dial phone for the first time in the United States. 
Then when I moved to Chicago, uh, although I had a dial, we had a dial phone where I lived, uh, not all of Chicago had dial telephones, and that would have been, what year was that? Uh, that would have been 1957. So kind of an interesting uh, uh, uneven progress there. Um, so with, with the, the imposed restrictions that you had in, 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 on your family in Germany with mm -hmm. what was going on, were there other things that, that you didn't have that other families might have had in, in the U.S., television or? My dad was, uh, didn't want a television in his home and resisted that for many years. It's only when he was quite old that my mom finally, well, my mom got a television. I think that fam we gave her a television and then he would watch it with her sometimes. Uh, the, the, um, it's an interesting question because in World War II, I can remember a lot of people didn't have much. I mean, it, there, was, there wasn't a lot of uh, metallic stuff coming off of assembly lines. Um, and uh, I don't, don't remember there being much difference when I was growing up. Where, even though my dad was a doctor, we were never a real prosperous family. Um, uh, during my, uh, you know, if I think about my single years, um, uh, social worker doesn't make that much money and didn't in those days. It got better in later years, but uh, uh, I did without a lot of things. Did you, l looking back on it, do you think your, your dad didn't want the TV there because he wanted to focus more on, on family and talking or he just didn't like the, t the television? Or was there really no reason? That, um, I think he, uh, probably a mix of things, but, uh, you know, and somewhat of a resistance to change. He, he was not a young man anymore when the first TV started appearing in 1949. But the programming was so, you know, there wasn't much to watch. Uh, and all it did is absorb people's attention and didn't offer much. Uh, and I had the same feeling about it for a long time. Uh, and sometimes feel that way about it today, to be candid. Uh, there's an awful lot of junk on TV and a lot of stuff uh, that, seri that passes for being serious. It's really entertaining. Yeah, just entertainment. Sorry, I <laughs> probably, no, uh, that's probably, fine. probably, you know, this sort of activity is, I think, is worthwhile, but there's a lot that appears it isn't. And what kind of games did you play as, as a child growing up? You know, it's interesting. We, uh, I, when I looked at the, at the question, I had to think for a while, too, because it changed over the years somewhat. But I remember when we were older, we played Monopoly a lot. Uh, we, a lot of card games that I don't see much today. I remember when uh, a lot of hearts. Um, and when Canasta came out, that was big for a while. Everybody seemed to everybody played Canasta. Uh, and it was a fun game. I remember it as such. Later on, I played Bridge. I was older. Well, I was actually in the Army when I learned to play Bridge. But uh, I think guard, card games were paid a lot more, played a lot more than they are today. There were some other board games, I just can't remember them offhand. Did you play those same kind of games with, you, with your children? To some extent. I remember Kerplunk, and uh, I remember Chinese, oh, Chinese checkers I ought to mention. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. We all learned to play checkers and chess, by the way. I ought to mention that. But, uh, those were the two, bo uh, you know, sort of uh, board games that came back. And uh, yeah, I, st I played those with my own kids when they were growing up. Did you have a favorite game or a favorite toy when you were a child? Oh, there's a, the famous story of the rabbit that I had when I was very young, uh, when I was in Germany. And I played with it so much and it was with me all the time, sort of like in the comic books with Calvin and Hobbes and such. Uh, and uh, so the story goes, I don't remember the incident, but my mom took me to a porthole on the SS Washington when we were in New York Harbor and tossed it out into the harbor. So I never saw my rabbit again. So that, oh, how sad. You know, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Those are things that I wish I did remember and don't. Like uh, one time I actually saw Hitler. He came by while we were on the street. I was, my grandmother was walking me and my younger uh, sister when this great man went by in his car and I, I wasn't at all interested and don't remember the incident very well. So I can't speak uh, as if it actually occurred. How did art and music affect your life? Uh, actually in somewhat, probably in a sort of way that um, probably 
pretty profoundly in some ways, in ways that I don't always clearly remember. For example, we always had classical music in the house. Uh, you know, the old 78 recordings, and then there were a lot of, there were a number of classical music uh, um, uh, stations on the air. So I was a big part of that, and I occasionally went, and I, especially when I was older, a teenager, I had a friend who, in fact, later on, he uh, was a second violinist for the Cincinnati Symphony. Um, so he invited me to come to a summer opera with him in Cincinnati. So that aspect of classical music really left a big effect on me, and I still enjoy it today. Um, dance, probably somewhat less so. It didn't, you know, it didn't appeal to me that much. Although I occasionally, my wife likes ballet, so we we go to uh, events occasionally. And uh, what are some of your hobbies and special interests? I read extensively um, in history, for most part, but also in sociology. I have mastered the part of sociology I have to keep working on is the statistics of it, which is rather important, and that aspect of it. Uh, I like hiking in the outdoors a lot. Uh, I've done that all my life at times when it wasn't even very fashionable, but one of the first things I did when I came to Colorado many years ago was to join the mountain club. Now, I don't do that kind of hiking today, but we still go up to Rocky Mountain National Park. We were at uh, Yellowstone just a few weeks ago, and uh, we take some of the shorter hikes because that's enough to take us away from the crowd, and it's really pretty. The back is really pretty. I wish I could still backpack, but uh, it's, it's pretty taxing. Now, obviously, uh, uh, Germany's going to be on this list, but where, where have you traveled? Uh, most of my foreign uh, travel has been to Europe. I've never been to Asia, and um, I want to get down to South America. We keep planning trips, and things keep coming up, and it, we don't seem to get to it. It's any foreign travel is a big thing for us. Uh, we've got to plan that in advance and make sure that we can cover all our expenses. But uh, uh, the European trips have really been, uh, made some discoveries in Europe that I didn't know about. I don't like big cities, but I sure like London when we were there. And Rome was really a play. Uh, it was crowded and dirty in some ways, but uh, the culture in it was just almost overpowering. And you, uh, you mentioned Chicago and Yellowstone. Uh -huh. What about travel within the within US? Within the United States, um, uh, we've spent some time on the West Coast, uh, up in Seattle, and also I have, uh, the, one of the few close relatives I have in uh, the United States are in the greater San Francisco area, in the Bay Area. And so we've spent some time out there. And uh, other national parks in Utah, we really like the national parks and expect, I've never been on North Rim of the Grand Canyon, we expect to go there later this summer. Nice. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, your years here in Lakewood. How did you become involved with the city of Lakewood? Well, um, when we got married, we thought about where to live, and I said, well, we both live, we both work in Jefferson County. I'm kind of scattered across the county as, a so, as social workers were at that time. My wife taught at Wilmore Davis, and they said, We'll live here, except we didn't think of it as Lakewood. I think it was kind of a more amorphous idea. And as it happened, Lakewood incorporated the year after we married. So uh, we've lived here ever since. We bought our house that year also and still live in the same house. And um, how did you start uh, working for the city of Lakewood? That's interesting. After I got my law degree, I wanted something to do, and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to make a big job shift. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed t studying law, but practicing it is another thing. And um, at that time, you didn't have the glut of lawyers that you have today. And I had, I had already had some contact with the city attorney, and I called him one time. I said, can you use someone to do extra research for you for the summer? And he said, oh, it's mana from heaven. He, 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 was working, he had several projects going. So for the next two summers then, I uh, did uh, six, I think that would, would have been, uh, gosh, I don't even remember exactly. I, it would have been 61 and 62. I, I signed on and worked for them and during the summer months. And, uh, what kind, and was there any kind of work later on? Um, uh, well, 
I was, <laughs> I, I wrote, I drafted the first draft of the, uh, uh, of the liquor, authority, for the, that created the original liquor authority. Uh, because uh, it was getting to be such a burden on council's time. But it was controversial. Con some members of council didn't want to let go of it. And my first draft uh, never was adopted. I think it was rewritten later on. But when we finally had a liquor authority, I think around 1973 or thereabouts, um, I was appointed to it. And that used to be a joke around the city attorney's office. He wrote the ordinance and I... <laughs> He's, he sits on the commission. And eventually we rotated the chair of the commission, so uh, I was chair a couple times too. And that, I think I did that until about 1980, 1978 or 80, I can't remember exactly. How would, how would you say you influenced the growth and development of the city? Uh, probably not so much the development of the city because I, you know, as subdivisions were created, uh, I was usually a, a bystander, if anything. But I did, uh, I ran for city council in 79. And then uh, I also ran for the original, for, well, not for the original Charter Commission. That would have been uh, somewhere around 1971, 72 in there. And that one didn't make it. They got very contentious. They reported out a charter, but citizens wouldn't adopt it. Um, there was another Charter Commission to be created. I ran for the commission. Uh, I, got a, I would have been elected except the whole issue failed. Uh, then I ran again when, it, uh, so when they tried it a second time. That would have been in 82. And at that time I was elected and I was on the Charter Commission. We went through and we did the whole torturous bout. We tried it the first time with there were 21 of us. It was voted down. It came a second time. Um, we changed some things and it became fundamentally the same charter we have today. That was a great adventure for me. I, I was in the city charter, let's put it that way, and had some correspondence with, other, uh, with some other agencies on the subject and did a research on some of the more contentious issues about it so I could bolster up some of the legal argument at that time. Um, that, that was a good piece uh, and uh, was exhausting took some time away from my family when my kids were quite small. And, um, uh, but I felt that we produced something that was really uh, of substance. And we still see that today. And for the record, what was the result of the 79 council election? Oh, I lost big time. Uh, 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 an incumbent by the name of Paul Thompson asked me to run with them and run uh, kind of in tandem. And the whole idea was, uh, wasn't a good idea. I was a total novice for one thing. Didn't know how to organize a campaign and I had to learn it one step at a time. Uh, and besides that, I, the, I'm trying to remember who, um, there were, it, it wasn't like many of the races of today for city council. There was quite an array of candidates. I think it was five or six of us that were running at the same time. Who were some of your contemporaries and peers? when you were working at the city? In those days? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I'm thinking, uh, I had to remind it of her, uh, Carol Bacher was uh, prominent in city affairs. Norma Beard was someone that I supported for many years for uh, city council and also, also Dorothy Weiscarver. We were sort of political peers at that time even though they were older than I was. Um, some of the people on council that I still remember today would be Pearl Alperstein, uh, Darlene Root, Walt Kane, I think had a lot to, to give to that. Uh, and he was, of course, city administrator and then later on city manager. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving out some real important people. Ray Johnson himself, who was a city attorney for a number of years, uh, was someone that, that uh, I took as kind of a mentor, he didn't have that kind of time, but I, I also looked to him on, on serious issues. Um, and I also listened carefully if Walt Kane ever spoke. Um, uh, some of the other people that maybe I didn't admire as much but who were still important would be Bill Reitler who was mayor for a long time and who fostered, actually fostered the uh, uh, creation of a city charter although he wanted it to be his charter. He had, <laughs> when I didn't realize it, but most of the members of the Charter Commission actually had copies of a charter that I never saw. Uh, but that's all part of the game. So, uh, and uh, Carl New, I think, was an important player at that time. 
Uh, he was on city council and I think a, a leading figure there. Um, you know, I actually remember, although I wasn't as active then, when I worked in the city, uh, in the very early days of the city, when I worked in the city attorney's office, Bob Clement was on city council for a while. And he's an important figure, too. And I think our, our first mayor, uh, Richie, was really an important figure in that era. But that, that's a nice thing about municipal go government. People don't stick around for a long time. They do their job and move on, at least. If we have a healthy city government, I believe that's the way it works. So I lived through about two or three, and it could be said four or five eras, because I remember when Linda Shaw and Linda Morton were mayors too. Now at that point, I wasn't as active. I was more active in professional activity and, and, and other areas. What memorable events took place while you were working for the city? Well, um, uh, you know, the fact that we got a charter was a big issue. Uh, I remember the, when we did the first big rewrite of the zoning ordinance. I wasn't a big player in that, and I tried to follow it as best as I could. Uh, you know, we're going through the same thing now. Uh, zoning ordinances are very intricate, and it, it's almost, they're trying to make it less so now, which is commendable, but I don't, it, in some ways you almost can't, because the amount of detail that you have to absorb is really great. Um, I didn't particularly care much for the zoning ordinance that they finally enacted. Uh, there were, and I, I have to go into some detail to tell you why. Uh, but um, it, it was a big event, not, notwithstanding, uh, in terms of city. Um, there are probably some other things that have slipped out of my head at this time because uh, uh, some of the ceremonial aspects of the city. I think obtaining both Audenbrook and Belmar Parks were big, big time issues that sort of percolated up from the citizenry. The city wanted Audenbrook and had a plan to get it. It did not want Belmar. It had to kind of be, the city government sort of had to be tugged on to get Belmar. But the citizens actually, by popular vote, passed a bond issue and you had to pay for it uh, and uh, an, an ordinance to absorb it. Uh, and that worked. It didn't get as much of Belmar as they wanted. Uh, I think uh, Craddock had already torn down the, uh, the, uh, the uh, home that was there, the huge estate home. And, uh, but the city restored it and uh, it's really, it really worked out well. What are some of your favorite memories about working for the city? I like the fact, when I actually worked for the city, that this was a brand new city that was being formed. Uh, you know, from a community that already existed, but it was a new entity, a corporation. And I felt that was a big challenge. And I also thought it ought to be done well. Um, and one of the things that I really liked is that we had some good police chiefs. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the, the our second police chief uh, came from California. I can't think, I should remember his name because he's a fi he was a leading figure at that time. Lynch was the first one. Brooks? And he, Brooke, uh, Pierce Brooks, Pierce yeah. Brooks. No, he was an outstanding chief, uh, and he knew how to build a real uh, a force that had some moral aspect to it, because a lot of police forces, well, they, I, I don't want to, it's, it's hard to think of a good analogy, but they sort of just grow and get to look like other police forces, and this one was really developed differently. But there were other city institutions that were, th were worth looking at too. Zoning, and I know we had real troubles with the building department later on. We went through a bad period there and actually brought over a police officer to be administer the building department for a while. Uh, that was, I'm trying to remember, I can't date that exactly. I want to say somewhere around 1980, but I'm not sure. What do you want to be remembered for in terms of your contributions to the city? Well, first of all, getting a charter that was workable, and second of all, preserving open space. And that's going to continue to be a challenge. I think there's still those people in the world that look at a beautiful open field and say, ah, 280 units, <laughs> uh, X parking lots, so forth. Uh, and there's a place for that. I, I'm not op opposed to development. And, you know, I'm watching uh, what's happening at Green Gables pretty closely, recognizing that they're 
you know, we can't preserve every piece of open space. But I think back of Mayor Reitler in an unguarded moment, I have to say, because he was the premier developer mayor. But one time I could, and I remember this distinctly, he said, why, if we all lived where we wanted to live, we would all live in a park. Yeah, right, <laughs> Mayor. Well, he, he said it all. How did working for Lakewood influence your life? I think it gave really a, almost, I don't know whether it's the right word, transcendental sense of, sense of purpose. In other words, there was a sense of purpose where I could leave some footprint. You know, maybe not a very visible footprint, but I know it's there. Why did you want to work for the city? Was there some uh, feeling of civic duty or wanting to make a change? I think it's a city, it, it was a sense of civic duty. I believe that every citizen should be involved in some level. You know, we can't have it all up to our chins, really. It, it doesn't work that way. Some of that, of course, comes from my family. My dad wasn't, you know, he always, uh, he says, I'm a doctor, I have my intellectual life, I have to think about my patients, that's, medicine is my big occupation. He always said that he wasn't that interested in politics, but essentially was. My mom was quite the other way. Uh, she was a member, local member of the League of Women Voters her, her whole time. Uh, and I didn't mention that earlier. I just kind of flashed in my mind right now. She attended a lot of city council meetings when I was growing up. And I attended some too when I was a teenager, just out of curiosity. Um, and uh, I was interested in the kind of charter we had back then. Uh, uh, the a town I grew up for a long time had an electoral system that in some ways was ahead of its time and in some ways wasn't all that workable, but uh, I, uh, I was one of the few people, well, I think of myself as that, who really became acquainted with it. Um, and that sort of thing interested me. I wanted to see democracy as a living force. And uh, I've always been committed to that. And, you know, the lesson of Nazi Germany, I've probably read a lot more than I really remember because I was too small. Um, but that's, that's been an enduring lesson, too, of what happens when a lot of really intelligent people let government get away from them because that's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. And a lot of smart people who shouldn't have let some awful things happen. How did working for Lakewood affect and influence your immediate family? Um, <clears throat> uh, political involvement overall. Now, later on, I, I took two runs for the state legislature um, in the 80s. And I think that was pretty hard on the family, really. My wife gave me a lot of support on that. In fact, she practically ran the campaigns uh, for much of the time. Um, and I think the kids, you know, they were asked about things at school and such. Um, that was probably where the impact came in. That was less so the city of Lakewood than p partisan politics. Um, Lakewood probably not so much, although in the time that I was on the charter, which overall wasn't that, that much, it was, I think, uh, two, three to four month periods that I had to give a lot of attention to it. Um, that, that, uh, that, that worked out okay, really, for the most part. What was the best thing about working for the city? What's that? What was the best thing about working for the city? I think the involvement and the peer involvement with people who also knew a lot about the subject. You know, in my everyday life, I can talk about council, I can talk about the structure of city government and so forth, and people's eyes glaze over. But when I was uh, really active with the city of Lakewood, that wasn't the case at all. People were involved. Yeah, tell me more about this. Can you explain that? And, you know, they in turn could explain things to me. What was the worst thing about working for the city? Oh, watching the thing go uh, during the 80s, things really slid toward development in a big way. And then there was a series of disappointments uh, when uh, we had to get a new city manager. Um, I'm trying to think, I think that was when Walt. No, that was when uh, Kirchhoff left and trying to replace him. We went through we burned through two city managers pretty quickly. 
and th I could see things were wobbling. Now, I wasn't much involved in that. I, I was helping, you know, I would help on council campaigns, the council people's campaigns, but I thought the city wobbled a bit at that point, and um, that, that, that troubled me, and I didn't want to see the, I, I wanted to see development, but I didn't want to see development being the whole thing that tooled the city along. Uh, and I still have that concern. There's still the fact that there's land there, you've got to put it to use, it has to be put to maximum use. I think there, there has to be a balance in terms of livability and having an economic base for the city. And you know, the city isn't that self-contained. We're just a row of suburban cities. And people often don't know where the boundaries are because of all the planning that's been done in, city, in cities. Lakewood never planned its boundaries. It just grabbed land where it could be absorbed. How old were you when you retired? Uh, I was 63. And what have you done of interest since you retired? Um, well, as I, I substitute taught, uh, I've done some traveling. Uh, I didn't realize at the time, but I had some pretty serious health issues to wade through after retirement and had to help my wife. She had some serious, uh, the year she retired, she had some serious health issues. So I had to kind of tool down. But I did help because I was concerned. I've mentioned this thing about development, and you asked me about low points in the city. I think what's happened in Belmar Park in terms of the structures that have appeared there, um, I think that's a wrong turn. I think trying to uh, save too much history that isn't really history has been an error. And putting it in a park has even been a bigger error. And I'm still kind of dismayed by that. But I was one of the founders of Lakewood Citizens for Open Space. We did make some progress. Uh, we did form what is now, the, or we helped form what is now the ACIC. Um, the uh, Commission for an Inclusive Community, which I think is a kind of a hokey name, but that's, it's there, it's, a, it's up and running, and we did help do that. Uh, as far as our ultimate purpose, I think it gave a much more greater focus on open space and on how we're going to preserve and preserve that balance that we really need. There are those who are complaining that Lakewood has too many parks, and I gotta say it hasn't got too many parks. We're probably about where we should be and could use a few more acres. Are you a grandparent? No, I'm not. Okay. Neither my, both my daughters are deep into their careers, so uh, I don't know when or if ever that will occur. Do you belong to any service organizations or volunteer in the community? Um, kind of embarrassed at the moment because uh, at, at the moment, no, I, I'm kind of disengaged uh, uh, at this time. I, I'm still uh, head of LCOS, but we're not a fully functioning organization right now. And uh, I'm revisiting my involvement there. And uh, actually, I'm kind of looking around for things. Um, I did leave out one thing. I worked on the census back in 2010. I really enjoyed that, as a matter of fact. Sorry, I can't tell you very much about it. You have to take all kinds of oaths <laughs> of things that you can't talk about. What do you like best about life right now? I like the ability to get up in the mornings and, and do the things that I find useful right then and there. If I want to sit and read, I can do that. If I want to work on my lawn, I can do that. Um, if I want to take a long walk in the park, I can do that. Um, but it's also a trap. In other words, um, there's always a necessity to have some, I believe, to have some discipline in your life and to be doing something that's useful to other people. And I'm casting around for, a, for, a, for something on that score. But on the other hand, I'm not asking for people to now say, hey, I've got something for you. No, it, it can't work that way. <laughs> I've got to work, find something that really, where there's a mutuality in terms of the interests involved. I really enjoyed substitute teaching, but you know, one, one gets to the point where you don't want to get up at six in the morning and be and face a classroom all day. Uh, what do you like about best? What do you like best about Lakewood? I really like the open space, and uh, I like the uh, increasing ability to move around the city. I'm trying to get back to bicycling again. I was a cyclist for a long time. I'd gotten away from it. It's not a good thing to get away from, although you know they, you never get away from riding a bicycle itself. But uh, in terms of the distances involved and the energy, that's something else. 
Um, but that's going to that's improving, and uh, I like being there. I and mean, you know, if I know I can walk three blocks to a bus stop, or actually it's a little longer than that, and I can be up in Arvada if I want to go there. And uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the uh, RTD being completed. I think that's a great boon. What's the most important thing you want people to remember about you? I think that um, I think that I was a that people would remember that I was a person with good judgment, with a solid vision of the future, and contributed something to it. Describe any old signs or buildings that are still near where you lived or or where you worked. Are still around? Well, there's been quite a transformation. Um, you know. They're gone. I think the, the original Dunstan uh, uh, was originally Dunstan Junior High, then it became Dunstan Middle School, and of course the structure is gone, and it turned out to be not, didn't have all the stability it should have, and, and there were some innovative ideas that didn't work well. But I was also a person who worked personally with Irene Dunstan on a committee uh, when I was first with the district. Uh, so I have make that association uh, pretty clear. Um, you know, I think about the fact that, uh, what is it, Molly Brown's summer home isn't very far from where I live. It's uh, down on, yeah, I, think, I don't think it's in the city of Lakewood. I think it is right adjacent to it, uh, the property line. And I think the, the, it's really something of an anachronism. I'd, <laughs> I, I'm not sure why it's there, but it is. And I guess it is a designated historical structure. Um, I don't, you know, I don't make the connection with a lot of the structures that are here like I do if I go to Europe, you know. Uh, I haven't uh, visited the uh, cathedral at Chartres, 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 I never can't pronounce that thing correctly, uh, in recent years, but I need to take, I want to take my wife back there eventually because uh, I was there years ago. But we're trying to build cathedrals too hastily, and they aren't really cathedrals, they're kind of 20th century junk. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I've got to be right up front on that. I don't think we're being, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're falling in love with things that are a mere century old that maybe aren't that, aren't that lovable. And the, the Lakewood Historical Society wanted to know if you had any old photos from the past that you would want to share with them. I doubt it. I think it's all the photos I would, any photos that I might have are far too recent. Um, I, d I don't know. I'd, I'd have to look and see because for many, you know, I went through a photo era in my life when I took a lot of pictures. I had a Retina 2C that I really liked to use a lot and did. Um, then somehow everything's, you know, changed and now it's other family members that take most of the photos. So. I'd, I'd, I'd have to look back and think. Um, I might have some uh, photos of the city hall when it was, the original city hall when it was under construction. Would, would it be okay if they contacted you in the future if they wanted to get a copy? Yeah, of sure. Uh -huh. In fact, I was a member for a while. I've got to check on that too because I am interested in history. I'm, I'm not always focused on the same history the Lakewood Historical Society is. Okay. Well, we appreciate you coming in, Mr. Cohen, and taking part in this project for us. Okay. Well, Thank it's you. been a pleasure being here. Thank That's you.